Hello everyone, uh, how are you doing? Uh, today we will be talking about the legal and ethical steps uh, that yields to the productivity uh, every entrepreneur and the startup desires. Uh, but before we start on the formal event, uh, let me start by thanking uh, MHRD's Innovation Cell, uh, which is a part of Government of India, uh, Institutions Innovation Council, uh, and uh, also AICTE uh, for giving me this opportunity to do this event with all of you today. And of course, uh, CPAM, uh, who recommended me probably to AICTE for conducting this event. Before we start in a brief introduction about me, I am Harith Mohan. I'm CEO and founder of Signicent. Uh, Signicent is a patent research company located in uh, Mohali in India and Delaware in the United States. The company started off in 2012 and we've been into seven years uh, doing patent researches and a lot of patent filing activities across the globe. So today's agenda, we would be talking about in uh, about the startups, we will be talking about the IPR stuff. We will be talking about a lot of entrepreneurship stuff. So let's get rolling. And on the left hand side of my screen, uh, you know, you will be seeing. Uh, let's start with startups first of all. So when you start uh, with a company, the major thing that you would require is how do I find an idea? Uh, so I've been mentoring a lot of startups personally. And what I've always, uh, uh, you know, faced is from the startups. They do not know how to make a startup, how to find an idea first to make a startup. So all these are the key problems that anybody who is willing uh, to go into the entrepreneurship part would face. So with my experience, these are the five things. Of course, there could be many more. Uh, it all starts with observation. Uh, let's start with a very basic example here. So let's assume that you know you are you want to charge your mobile phone uh, and uh, you want to charge your mobile phone and there is no table around so what we do we often do we try and balance the mobile phone over the top uh, of the charger and what happens when it vibrates yes it falls down so so then there could be some solution towards it that we think should be there that we could focus on or that we could try and utilize uh, in the terms of innovation and if that innovation is also possible to be used by masses that's their the startup idea so the basic learning is we need to observe the problems that are uh, you know that are around us that are always there around us and we need to start uh, finding some very good solutions uh, to solve those problems a lot of people also you know surf a lot they they kind of read a lot uh, they become expert in some area when they you know start reading about around a problem for a few weeks couple of months and then they start realizing what is available what is not available in ip terms that's called as prior art so prior art is anything that is existing uh, to solve a particular problem uh, and then your challenge as an entrepreneur is to find something even more innovative so we'll be talking more about that in our sessions today uh, some people are very fond of reading books, so there are a lot of people who have said that book reading is possibly uh, you know, something where you can get an idea as, as well from. Writing journals, you should observe uh, what you do. Uh, you, know, you should write, take notes. Uh, uh, sometimes it happens, of course, often with me. I get some idea at the night when I'm about to go to bed, and by the morning you know, I get up, bang, the ideas are gone. So, so you need to be very sure. So I personally keep a notepad in my mobile phone where I keep writing the ideas that I get because who knows that could be a million dollar idea and they will be gone like that uh, before you could document it somewhere. Uh, what I've also learned in my uh, you know, 12 years of entrepreneurship journey is you should socialize a lot. I mean, you should talk to a lot of people in, uh, from the same uh, business areas from the different business areas try and imbibe how they have solved a certain certain problem and how they are you know finding towards it so uh, you know going further uh, once you have an idea which is of course uh, uh, sometimes difficult task uh, I, I have taken a lot of sessions uh, with young entrepreneurs and this is what I often tell to them that idea creation uh, could be easily plotted uh, on the terms of quality that an idea has when you're thinking to solve a problem and the time uh, it needs uh, to generate such a good idea. So how it starts is like this. So, uh, you know, when we start thinking, let's take an example of, you know, 
uh, let's say I want to plan after this lockdown is over, I want to plan my vacation. What's the first place I want to go? So the minute you start talking with your friends, with your family, the most obvious uh, you know things start coming up. So I'm in Chandigarh right now. So for us, for example, Shimla is very nearby. It's like four hours from here. So the minute I say something like where should we go, my family would say let's go to Shimla. So that's you know of course the relevant idea. It took less time to come up, but no, I have visited there multiple times. So does my family, and then we you know kind of hit a uh, bottom where we are you know more time is being spent and we are not able to find a good location. And you know some ideas are coming. Um, you know some of us are uh, kind of declining it, and the things and the thoughts go over for some time. Sometimes we give up. Sometimes the discussion rolls over. Gradually, what happens is after spending some time, you get something more novel. Of course, it may not be as relevant as it seems, uh, like the Shimla example, but this could be a uh, you know a small uh, a small town in the foothills uh, of Himalayas where which is less explored. Uh, it's more novel to go there and it took us time uh, basically to you know, decipher or to reach that idea. This happens in every ideation stage to be often. Uh, so you know the, the important thing that you should learn from here is give time, uh, you know, take some time when you are uh, uh, solving a particular problem. Uh, get via this curve and get something very novel out, uh, out of it. Uh, on the on the right hand side uh, of the screen, uh, what you would see here is that some of the ideas uh, needs time to diffuse. Uh, again, let's let's uh, understand this with the help of an example. Uh, uh, remember the time when e-commerce started, maybe you know seven eight years back. How many of us were actually confident that we could go go to the Flipkart or Amazon and start buying stuff? Uh, to be very honest, people were very afraid. Would we get genuine products or not? Uh, would that uh, you know yield uh, uh, value for my money? Would I get something totally fake? Will they take my money? They will not deliver me the product and all those stuff and all those fear was there in somebody's mind. Now what happens was imagine that you were in a class, a group of friends and family. There were of course a couple of people who always take that initial risk. So these are the people uh, you know we call as innovators. These are the people who stand in queue when the new iPhone launched. Uh, they stand over the whole night to grab their first iPhone. They're the risk takers, they're the innovators who want to rely on a product without the market getting tested. So for any startup, any, any entrepreneur to get this is a challenge and then comes the next 13.5% of the population which we call as early adopters. So when the e-commerce e industry grown, what happened was uh, there were people, you know, let's assume we were in a class of 50 people. After the first three, four have done it, then comes the next five, seven people who were, you know, the early adopters of the technology. They saw the first two people who were very happy. They got good discounts. They were not cheated and they jumped in. They also started using e-commerce. Then, you know, when five, seven, eight people have in the class have done, 20 jumps, 25 people jump in from the whole class. And that's like saying that about about half of my class is using e-commerce and it of course took a few years uh, before uh, you know a lot of people relied uh, over it. And then when everybody saw that 50% of people around me are buying it, the late majority jumped in. And then there are of course people who never uh, ever go to e-commerce and they are the laggards. We call them as laggards. So this is how the law of diffusion of innovation happens. This is how if you are doing some startups, if you are you know, finding the solution and want to sell it, uh, it has to go to the same uh, diffusion curve and that's how uh, you know, it would go about it. And uh, then there is uh, you know, important key thing uh, that I would also like to share uh, with you. Uh, if we uh, kind of value the impact versus the time uh, that is there uh, to find an idea or to get an idea into the market, how should we go about it? So what we do is uh, there are uh, you know low to high impact idea and once again everything's time is money in business. So there is low to high amount of time uh, that is going into it. So if for example, uh, uh, if I am getting uh, you know something which has no impact on my business, uh, and the time of course is taking less that is not of my priority. If the impact is low, if the idea quality is not that good and you think it, just, it is going to take you several months or maybe years to develop it, no, this is not the right time. It, you can you know, go out of cash much before a low impact idea of yours uh, uh, could even come to the market. So you should of course diffuse such ideas as an entrepreneur. 
then uh, there are uh, of course uh, you know ideas which are high impact factor but of course time is going to be also high so they are very good for long term because of course the impact that they could leave to the market is good so you should never ignore them but then as a startup as an entrepreneur uh, you want to first roll out something that you could start generating revenue with or you can start paying back uh, your investors with or you start paying salaries to your employees and then these are the ideas you should definitely work at next thing that you should also realize is that the the the, the very good ideas are the one which is less time consuming and of course they have high impact these are the ideas that we should always go for so whenever now you are ideating next when you are creating some innovation when you are thinking from some idea that's the metrics uh, you know that you need to keep in mind now what's the ideation phase has been over uh, you know of course you need to you know talk to a lot of people you need to do a lot of uh, maths and r and d to see if it is market wise feasible or not uh, we assume once you reach to that uh, you know phase then comes the legal aspects of any startups uh, and with legal because i come from an uh, intellectual property rights background we specialize in patents so i would say ipr is something very important uh, that any startup any entrepreneur Uh, should definitely care about so the next few minutes we'll be spending upon understanding uh, very quickly uh, ip at a glance so then there are patents there are trademarks there are copyrights there are geographical indication and there are industrial designs uh, patents are something which are given for uh, what we call as uh, solutions towards a problem uh, in hindi we get call as jugad uh, trademarks are something that uh, makes you represent Uh, uh you know some of your brand some of your logo for example you would see the signisense uh, uh logo right here uh, on the top of the slide uh, which is basically uh you know trademark of signisense and then there is co- copyright so for example the presentation that i'm giving you right now is a content that i have written or we have created and thus it's a copyright material and nobody could uh, you know uh, you know use it as such copyright could also cover very quickly poetry if there are some you know shires in the audience today uh, if there are painters people who draw people who write blogs uh, for something all that comes under a copyright because there are content geographical indication is something that is given to uh, you know a geography for example we could talk about uh, uh, kolapuri chappal uh, we could talk about uh, amritsari naan uh and uh, we could talk about any assam tea uh, for example they are all geographical indication people would like uh, you know to associate a certain part of geography with the products that they are famous for of course uh, from the areas that you are belonging to today uh, would have some geographical indication too and then there are industrial designs they are basically the ornamental designs uh, so for example if today you are using a mobile phone or your laptop to watch my session uh so the design of that uh, would be falling under designs or the technology behind it would go under patents now let's try and quickly do a very quick exercise uh to gather it and of course uh, at your place uh, as i you know i'll take a pause before i show you the answers of the next screen and probably you can take this quiz uh, to see uh, if you get the concept so let's start guessing here what's the first thing uh, that you see on the screen is about so first thing is uh trademarks so this, this is a logo uh, you know we are talking about uh, a company's brand uh, uh, value and if i also say the phrase i am loving it uh, what uh, what brand does you associate it with you would say mcdonalds because you know the phrase it also related to the branding uh, of uh, that company so phrases logos even the tunes uh, uh, like har ek friend zaruri hota hai Uh, britannia sting ting tinning all these tunes are also basically trademark because they associated uh, themselves with certain products or brands uh, behind them so this on this screen right now uh, is a camera design which we are using for maybe shooting today's video also so what's this camera design about so this camera design is basically falling under if you see look at the design aspect it will fall under industrial design but if you talk about the entire technology the arrangement of lenses and things like that it would fall under patents next uh, five point someone this is a book so books fall under yes copyrights and then last if you talk about the secret formulas uh, uh, they would fall under trade secrets because nobody knows uh, as of now exactly what coca cola use uh in their composition another way of remembering a secret formula could be let's say the kfc's uh, recipe uh, that makes chicken so delicious for them 
uh, next in line we could also talk about let's assume this is a mustache uh, uh, device which you, somebody you know uses this device uh, to kind of sharpen the mustache so which is this device so of course this would also fall under the patents uh, area and next if we talk about this painting uh, and the painting is once again content so and this will fall under copyrights uh, next we have phone uh, this would fall under uh, patents or designs if you're talking about patent designs uh, and this logo uh, would go under trademark so as we pause in a little here uh, to help you digest so we talk about patents trademarks copyrights uh, geographical indication uh, as the key uh, IPR uh, rights that you could own uh, for the startups or the things that you're creating. Uh, so before we make move to the next section, this is for example, design patent, do you remember? Uh, yes, it's a Tesla's logo and this is trademark. Then you talk about chapels, uh, you know, this come under uh, geographical indication. And then we have the mouse designs, uh, you know, that uh, would also fall under uh, the mouse designs, uh, uh, you know, patterns of the technology uh, behind it. And so now the next and the key question that we want to face is why, uh, you know, safeguard the IP? Why do you need to safeguard the IP? So there are multiple reasons uh, you would like to, you know, safeguard your IP. Uh, the first reason is uh, uh, you know it helps you commercialize because if you have a patent uh, in, in in place what you could do is uh, you could of course make sure nobody's going to copy it for at least the period of uh, patent life that is generally 20 years uh, and uh, uh, people uh, could ask the license for it so for example i was reached uh, by a uh, a uh, junior of mine from college time, uh, you know, they, they, they are generating some COVID masks these days and they had a very basic question that every startup today has. Now they have the technology, they could think over it, but they do not have the mass production rights. They cannot have the mass production capabilities rather. So if you do not have the capabilities, the best way people do it is they take it, the patent license uh, to some other big company. They get the royalty, they get you know five to ten percent of the share of every product that is sold in the market or you could be uh, do a voluminous deal of the licensing on an annual basis you get the money no matter what happens irrespective of the sales and you get happy so patents start making you uh, you know commercializing the stuff if it is trademark uh, you know of course there are a lot of uh, common trademarks people get into crux uh, with it tucks with it like you know i have my trademark a company b is copying my trademark imagine you know today ubers uh, which is now known for mobility uh, in our cities there is another uh, tuber that is created uh, uh, and then you know of course it will yield to confusion and uber will not like it so so you know it's very important that you should safeguard ip uh, before uh, you know you start launching uh, enormously into the market and uh, you need to uh, protect your innovation in the right form of IPR legally. Uh, it also of course help you in recognition and rewards. A lot of colleges, a lot of uh, uh, universities today relates promotions, appraisals, salary hikes in the terms of patents. So that's also coming up. There are taxation advantage, uh, you know, a lot of governments give you uh, if you are you know owner of a patent and of course it helps you build the brand now imagine your startup has 15 20 30 patents of course it will help you a lot in your branding activity so for all these reasons it's very important uh, that you should uh, safeguard uh, your ip so how does it all work so the first thing is we need to validate idea and file a patent thereafter by validation of idea what i mean is you need to uh, you know kind of do a quality check on the idea that you have now this could be done on google searches if you do not want to hire uh, uh, you know a professional agency like us uh, you could uh, what i would suggest is start using google patents uh, rather than google alone uh, start using uh, you know uh, european patent office start using something known as patent lens so that's where the lot of technology documents you would find so it's like validating your innovation that there is no prior art, something backdated does not exist when you are going for the filing uh, of your technology of your patent. So that's the validation step. We call it as a patentability uh, analysis. So of course, uh, companies like us do such stuff a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, then once the validation of ideas happen, you go to 
uh, patent filing. These days in Indian patent office, it's easy to get e-filing done. You can just log on to the patent office website, uh, so, you know, make the necessary forms uh, that are there and go ahead and uh, file the patents. The pricing is very simple. Uh, they generally, uh, you know, uh, price for the startups much less as compared to the bigger organization, uh, uh, you know, that is there. Uh, in the terms of pricing, uh, any, uh, you know, you, you can, uh, get your filing done via a professional company uh, at less than about 10,000. Of course, drafting is something today which is tricky. Uh, that could uh, go into, uh, you know, uh, a few thousands more uh, because you're going to draft via a patent attorney who understands the technology and the technical and the legal aspects behind it. So that's uh, the recommendation that I have with the startup because you do not want to risk with a loose patent at when you go to the market. Three years later, this is something that is going to save you. And then you have to, uh, you know, the patents would get published. Uh, uh, so uh, this could take a year, year and a half uh, to get it done. Um, and then once it is published, it's all in government's hand, by the way, no private organization controls that. And then it is granted. Uh, and this could take anywhere between two to three years uh, to get a patent grant. But can I start manufacturing my product already? Yes, you could. Once ideally, when uh, you know you have filed a patent, you can start manufacturing. Uh, or marketing uh, your product uh, very quickly and uh, uh, then of course a lot of companies write patent pending terms a patent pending terms does not uh, give legal rights uh, somehow but it does kind of alert your competition that you know do not copy my patent tomorrow when it gets granted uh, you know uh, anyhow you may have to either take license from me or you need to stop uh, uh, the same thing and of course you could uh, sometimes uh, uh, ask for damages done as well then it comes to valuation. Of course, once it is granted, sometimes people want to license it. And the major question people ask is, what's the dollar value or what's the rupee value of my patent? So that's a 20, 30, 40 page of paper a patent is, but it could have uh, you know crores in value if you want to do it right. And that's what we will be also talking about this presentation, how to, before taking commercialization via licensing route, you need to value the technology that you're working upon and there is no fixed algorithm but of course we have uh, some proprietary uh, codes written algorithms written by which we do commercialize uh, uh, you know technologies and we give you the uh, approximate value uh, based on the algo that we follow so let's uh, you know then quickly uh, jump to the market research part so that's another very important thing any inventor any entrepreneur should do where should I market it and what's my importance? So there are six important steps. First, define your objective, what you want to market, uh, what's the uh, the USP or the unique selling product, unique selling, uh, uh, you know, unique selling uh, pointers for your, uh, uh, for your unique selling propositions for your product, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for your product that you want to launch in the market. Then you need to determine uh, the research design. Uh, then you would be, of course, uh, you know, uh, 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 making a research instrument that how you want to do with it. You need to do some lot of market surveys, uh, uh, get your product tested, get those early feedbacks done. All that data is very important. And then uh, once that is done, you keep on analyzing that data. And then of course you visualize and communicate the findings. So that's how you need to do very uh, cleverly research on any product that you're going to launch in market. Uh, let me also tell you, and this is from a practical perspective, what I've seen is a uh, lot of startups, you know, keep putting time, a lot of entrepreneurs, they want to have the perfection in their product when they want to launch it for the first time. Uh, well, yes, some, some may say, you know, perfection is good for the product, uh, but then it's time consuming. Uh, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, keep investing uh, your time and efforts and of course money, for uh, you know, achieving towards 100% precision that the way you want it, mind you, you're losing time out of the market. What is recommended from my side is once you are 85-90% ready, of course there could be some bugs, some things that uh, you know that could be there. And if those bugs or uh, those improvisations are not critical for the functioning of your product, they are add-ons, they are improvements, they are the uh, they can help somebody even better. Uh, so these 10-15% of improvisations I think could wait. Uh, what could happen is when the product goes into the market, uh, there could be feedback coming from your consumers. So you should always keep the scope uh, for the time uh, for such consumers to react to your product and that should be iteratively taken back into your product and they should be, uh, you know, put into your product uh, once you are, uh, you know, approaching it. And companies does that. 
uh, in websites you get version one, version two, version three. Uh, in products you get uh, you know every few months companies revise their product, so it keeps going on. So when you're conducting market-based uh, approaches, there are two approaches: the primary and the secondary one. Secondary one, uh, to be very honest, is very simple uh, to begin with. Anybody can do it. It requires you to go on a market research website. Google is a good starting point. Look for what is available about your competition. Uh, you know, you could find some key peoples in the area. See how they are predicting the market. Uh, see what forecasting are they doing for the similar product. So that's something you know, searching with whatever available, whatever is available uh, in the market. So that's how you could do a lot of secondary approach based research. You could look for profit loss statements. You could you know read through journal magazines and you can you know go about it. Primary research is more critical. Primary research is basically collect collecting uh, the survey data from the actual people who wants it. Uh, and they are like that's why it is called primary. You want to interview somebody. Uh, LinkedIn, for example, is a good resource. Uh, you know, if you find something very good, go to LinkedIn, connect with the, uh, let's say, your peer in Europe, US, or India. Ask them questions. People are generous these days, especially in lockdown. They are, you know, kind of helpful, uh, and they are going to reply to you. So I would suggest that go ahead, uh, get as much primary approach market research done uh, for your startup as possible before you launch it. Uh, then coming to the next, uh, uh, you know, important aspect, the valuation of IP. Now that's the holy grail today. Now I have a technology. I have, uh, you know, my startup is working upon it. I am getting in big order, and I do not have the manufacturing capability, money, or labor to kind of produce it. What should I do? Should I decline the order? No. What you need to do is probably get the value, right value of your IP done. Uh, and uh, this would require several parameters and often requires an expert uh, to do it for you. Uh, and once you have the you know IP value, uh, you know you could get it, uh, uh, and you could have the license uh, value that you could negotiate on the table uh, with your uh, prospect. Some people also use IP value. Now I'm, I'm sure today a lot of startups uh, there already there or in future would be going to their investors. They would say give us X amounts, X dollars uh, uh, for my startup. And a lot of uh, you know uh, companies or investors, uh, investor firms ask you to value your IP. So that's what people in US uh, does a lot. Significant has been doing it day in and out uh, for a lot of startups to value the IP uh, uh, so that they can put it in their balance sheet, they can show it to investors and so on. Next, if there is some damage happen, you're at a you know advanced stage, uh, and uh, let's say if somebody copied uh, your product, uh, now how much you should sue uh, your competitor off? You again need valuation. Uh, it is sometimes important, uh, you know, to calculate uh, the future uh, that could be there, the demand and supply dynamics. So there are a lot of uh, objectives IP valuation, you know, uh, do us. So how could I do it? So there are two basic ways when we will quickly, you know, go through it. There is a quantitative way of doing it and there is a qualitative way of doing it. Now, quantitative uh, way is, of course, as the word suggests, is putting a dollar or a euro or a rupee value to your technology. Qualitative way of doing it is to kind of understand that how strong is my IP is uh, that relies on a lot of factors like uh, legal strength of the patents, how much life my patent is left with, uh, is my competitor citing uh, or using my patent to advance his uh, technology uh, and so on and so forth. So that's the qualitative way of you know uh, doing it and do you, do you ask me which is important? Both of them are important because one is telling you the actual value which you would sit on your table with and the other is telling, telling you about the quality of the technology that you're working in. So let's take the instruments that are there for each of them. Let's start with qualitative analysis. So one, you kind of understand the uh, qualitative analysis. From here, we're talking about a little advanced uh, step. I'm assuming here that you know the patterns, but I'll still uh, try and make it uh, as easy as uh, I can for my audience. So legal status analysis would mean, uh, for example, a patent uh, that is there. Uh, let's say if I have a claim, if I am claiming, for example, uh, uh, let's say the chair that probably I'm sitting today and taking uh, this session on, uh, you know, so anybody who is trying to make that chair at his workshop, is he actually allowed to do that when you drafted a patent? Uh, did you, you know, make it 
uh, too broad uh, as a claim or too narrow as a claim if you you know uh, restrict your findings uh, uh, in a patent in a very narrow way you're leaving a lot of white space for others to come in and uh, you know uh, poach your market but if you're going too broad uh, with your uh, technology protection the examiner who is going to grant your patent could ask you to cancel those broad claims so the right way is i need to understand the, uh, the, you know the legal uh, breadth or the legal uh, broadness of the claim it should neither be too broad nor be too less so that's again requires something of an expertise to do it but yes that's something you need should, should uh, you know talk uh, about when you are going for uh, patent terms and then you should also take care of the status of the patent especially if you are buying or selling ip now you know if there is 20 years the lifetime of a patent if it's already 18 years you won't be able to get much money for the last 2 years but yes yes if the technology is upcoming let's say if you had certain good patents in artificial intelligence today uh, and the uh, the future is coming your patent is just 5 years old uh, tested the market yes you have you know a bigger uh, you know quality and bigger market to address that so these are uh, you know some of the terms that legal status uh, you know would cover at so if you see this table very quickly now this is the european and the korean and great britain or the us patents these are the title of those patents and you would see uh, we have marked the live patents uh, which means that they are yet in force and of course they have more uh, legal value as compared to the patents which are dead or lapsed uh, in the table so that's how you know you could do your legal analysis uh, when you are into patent industry next you need to understand the technology and market coverage like how do i want to license uh, you know my uh, technology uh, is it a unique technology or you know could the same thing be done by alternative uh, technologies have i done sufficient testing uh does it require a lot of skills to uh, you know make it uh, you require some mits or iitns or you know some very good uh, uh, highly skilled labor uh, to make it uh, then uh, you know of course it's it's become very technology savvy project and you need to you know find your resources and value accordingly uh, could you see there are already infringing products infringing means that there are some copycats available uh, uh, for the technology that you own or the patent that you own so all that you know comes under qualitative uh, way of analyzing a technology uh, then uh, you know you could also look for a lot of bibliographic factors like number of claims it has now very quickly number of independent claims uh, you know is 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 a, is a good sign uh in a way that if your patents have a lot of claims and the broad ones get cancelled you still have narrower narrower scopes available and the patents may still be alive but then if there are too many narrow claims it would uh, dilute down the value of your patent uh then uh, some people say number of words that are there in the dependent claim so if you are to narrow uh, say a uh, a technology i would put more words in it uh, which by mean if i want to you know protect a chair that i'm sitting in if i'm putting too many restrictions chair has to be made of plastic it should have a back the inclination angle of my back is only 30 degrees that's like you know to putting too many restriction as compared to a patent which says it's very broad in nature and it covers all the type of claim so that's how what you know qualitative analysis is all about and there are about citations now if you for example wrote a research article uh, or let's assume that you know uh, let's let's take it today on facebook instagram you put a, a you know a good uh, message picture uh, and people do a lot of sharing uh, on on social networking of your post that's like forward citation uh, so you feel feel good if a lot of people are sharing your post likewise if a lot of people are citing your patents uh, when it is out in the market that's good for a patent backward citations for example is sometimes considered negative of that for example when you are making your instagram story you took pick bits and pieces from four or five places then consolidated that into a single post it means you used lot of backward citations backward posts to make uh, your post so so does go for technology you cannot rely on lot of background technology because then some people think it's not novel you are doing a a plus b plus c plus d kind of thing to make your e uh, which is then less innovative right so uh, so with this slide you know this is kind of a ranking the spider web chart wherein you know we rank a patent we score a patent for example there are six factors each factors is five points each and you would see we have scored it on a certain ground so this particular patent scores 22 of 30 which is decent score uh, you know to go ahead with uh then there is a quantitative uh, way of uh, you know analyzing uh, the market research methods so market research methods are you know you just do not want to know uh by some mathematics you do not you're not uh, you know having well equipped 
uh, resources who could actually uh, uh, value the technology uh, very clearly. So what do you do first? You kind of go hit the Google and see what exactly my competitors in the same area have done in past. So you get an it's idea. In airplane mode, so you I get, can't help you with you, that at the moment. You can get an idea, for example, there that you know market with page research reports are gonna have my competition's uh, a value in it. Similar deals have happened in the past. If you can find it on Google, you'll get an idea. Ki agar that person sold it for uh, one crore, my technology could also go for around uh, you know 75 lakhs to 1.25 crore. So it's kind of comparison thing. So this is chart that you will see on your screen right now is an example there that say a deal happened in OI and Toyota and that's how uh, you know the million dollar value you know that these deals happened in. So I can do a comparison and I can understand the market. The next math method that you do to value an IP is cost based method. Now cost based method is for example today I have a product and I want to create a replica of it. So if I being your competitor want to copy your product how much investment I need to do in the terms of replicating your product. So that's the cost based method. Of course, nobody is going to replicate it, but that's the way step by step way of thinking it to calculate the cost price of making something similar. Uh, then the other way is a replacement cost so that the first one uh, when I asked for copycat was to make a reproduction cost. Replacement cost is if I need to phase out your product from the market. What money do I need to kill your uh, product totally from the market? That's the replacement cost method. So one you can calculate these kind of methods. You could also value the technology or value the IP that you're working on. What we uh, you know often work is on income based method and this is what you uh, know so Cygnicent for example uses a uh, uh, cost based market based income based method to uh, all three approaches to get to a value and that can be averaged out. But income based is something that is tricky. You need to have a lot of uh, mathematical uh, background uh, 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 and you should know some of the very important factors like royalty rates. Now, for example, if I have a patent related to medicine, the royalty rate could be entirely different uh, from the royalty rate of a patent. Let's say if I have it in the area of softwares. Likewise, a coffee machine royalty rate could be different from a, a technology uh, in toothpaste industry. So it's very important for somebody using income based method to have the royalty rate. Generally, it varies between 5 to 10 percent of the entire deal volume. That's what you uh, could seek if you do not have any clue uh, about the royalty rates. So I would suggest you know bargain somewhere between 5 to 10 percent uh, for the royalty rates uh, if you're going to license out of uh, you know, your technology. And uh, you know when it comes to uh, uh, you know technology licensing, uh, there are a lot of uh, you know them. Uh, so, for example, you have exclusive and non-exclusive uh, licenses, uh, wherein uh, exclusive licenses would mean I have a patented technology, and I want to just exclusively give it to, let's say, uh, uh, you know, let's say Mahindra and Mahindra. But uh, am I open, uh, for example, to license that technology to Maruti, uh, Hyundai, or uh, uh, you know, Tata? I don't know that. So if you go for one company as your partner to license out that becomes an exclusive license while if you target multiple such companies uh, to you know take advantage of the technology it goes under the non exclusive license. So what about royalty rates then of course if you're going to do exclusively to one person uh, what would you charge of course you would charge more uh, to that person because he's the only one uh, you know who is going to uh, you know. Uh, Pay for it. A non-exclusive license would be the one. Since I'm going to, uh, you know, give it to multiple people, of course I can lower down my royalty rates a little because I'm going to collect it from multiple companies. So, assuming you are still uh, uh, with me, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, in the last few minutes of our talk, let's, uh, you know, talk about compulsory uh, uh, licensing. Compulsory licensing happens in a situation like this, uh, like in the case of COVID-19. Let's assume there is some company that gets a, a technology patent government may ask for the welfare of or the uh, you know saving a lot of lives in india uh, to have a compulsory license where they could ask a company that guys you cannot manufacture uh, and make the uh, supply to a lot of demand of covid 19 vaccines so we need to compulsory license it at a fair royalty rate to a lot of companies so uh, but you will still get the money, uh, but the uh, but you have to make sure that you need to maybe give it to your competitors also at a percentage rate. 
uh, to uh, you know uh, make sure that people are healthy because that's where it could get to cross licensing happens in an area wherein you know i have certain technology you have certain technology let's shake hand exchange technologies amongst each other for the betterment of a product uh, uh, you know so this happens a lot for example if uh, uh, a company is doing good in processors b company is uh, you know doing good in let's say uh, image processing they could you know give out some patents of processing technology and b company could give out some patents on uh, uh, you know uh, on image processing and they kind of cross license kind of barter uh, system there uh, carrot licensing and stick licensing is very important uh, for you to understand now carrot licensing is something uh, that uh, let's assume I have a technology, but there's an existing product available, but I know my carrot uh, licensing patent is going to add value uh, to the product uh, uh, that is already there in the market. For example, uh, let's 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 take that, you know, uh, we all paint now in paint. Uh, uh, how many of you have painted their homes uh, or if not painted their homes, at least been in the freshly painted room? Uh, do you feel that uh, pungent smell? Do you feel irritated with that smell? Uh, I mean, I do. So, so what happens is now there is a paint industry which has patents on the paint composition, but you have a very, very specific uh, technology that may be an additive and a composition that if added to the paint can kill down the fumes or the pungent smell that is out there in the paints. So what you could do is you go ahead and tell, for example, the paint company that if you take my license for a very specific technology that I own, you could add value to your existing product. It's going to increase the sales of your product. So that's where we are talking about carrot licensing. You add, you give a carrot uh, and ask the bunny to take it from you so that he feels good. Now stick licensing is something, uh, uh, you know, where you have the stick in hand like uh, police these days in coronaviruses so they they take the stick and make you do things or make us do things so stick licensing would mean that i know that for the technology that i own that i have a patent on there are companies that are copying my product i know i have a patent i know i am the right owners owner for that technology but then the companies are still there who are copying unlawfully illegally my product so i take the stick with the, uh, which is basically a patent right and kind of blow them off that guys either take the royalty uh, from me or license amount from me or stop using it stop manufacturing it cut it down so that's the stick licensing part of it where you kind of force somebody uh, to take the license from it so these are all the type of you know licenses uh, you know we have discovered so in a typical licensing agreement, uh, we know what does a licensee uh, get and what does a licensor get. So licensee uh, will have to have an agreement where they can, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, they have the, uh, they have the patent, uh, you know, that they want to license it out and they would have to give the rights to make, uh, you know, use, export, offer for sale, sell the licensed products. Uh, and then of course, uh, uh, the person would have to give you the money. Uh, you know for uh, you know for doing it so that's the agreement that happens between uh, you know the licensee and licensor and that agreement will make sure that you you know earn your royalties you know you get your milestone payments uh, you know as a licensor you get the fees and royalties and the licensee will get all the rights that otherwise a patent owner uh, would have in exchange of money so uh, you know then uh, let's talk about uh, some of the important components before we you know try and sum up so uh, there are fees and royalties but then you need to take care of confidentiality you need to definitely make sure that you have terms and terminations you you know you decided you want to do it for four years five years ten years and the entire life cycle of the patent you need to decide that then uh, you know uh, who's going to take care uh, if there is a patent maintenance fees needed if this something happens who's going to take care of the government fees if there is an infringement happens uh, you know who get the money uh, you know and how much uh, you know who, who is going to take the liability if something bad happens uh, what kind of warrants are there is there an insurance if uh, you know something bad happens so these are some of the advanced level important components that somebody has to make sure are there in a licensing agreement whenever you are going to go ahead legally uh, to give away your IP to somebody else. Uh, 
then towards the end uh, you know uh, let me uh, let me share with you uh, you know there are some ethical way of running a business they always are to be honest now business sometimes a uh, lot of people is says all about money uh, well yes about uh, money it is about money but then you know of course you could be ethical uh, in getting that money this may mean uh, personally to me going a little slow but then if ethics are there integrity is there trust me you're going to go long 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 term uh, in your business so what's the factor that you need from the ethical uh, you know perspective uh, that you should consider one look out for opportunities uh, you know give away to the community for example if today your company could uh, you know do some technology related to covid go away uh, get it uh, done for the entrepreneurs uh, with uh, to the fellow entrepreneurs who can you know uh, develop their technology even better for example what significant as my company did is uh, we are into innovation and patent so we gave a few few working hours free of cost uh, to people who are working uh, so i won't say it's 100% off but it could be a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, free hours of research and consultancy in covid 19 cases so we are giving back to the community the way we could uh, without charging them a penny for a good amount of consultancy uh and then of course define the core value of your organization at a very early stage so this is going to again you know stick uh for example if 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 you know that you know no matter what happens these are my core values i'm not going to dwindle out i'm going to not going to sell out my core values for making some quick money if you can decide that at an early stage you know you're uh, you you're uh, you're going to go for a very long run welcome healthy discussion from time to time with your staff with your colleagues with your partners uh ask them what is important to, uh, to them i mean for example i personally do that a lot with my managers in my company uh sometimes they may not not like their suggestions but then sometimes they are uh, ethically and valid suggestions so it's a fight between me and my uh, feedback that i'm getting and let the ethics you know win out there uh and then integrate the ethics into hiring uh, you know uh and this 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 could make you laugh also a uh, lot of people I, i i remember there were some companies when you were very small in size of course you were not able to offer money uh, uh, you know to the big competition that we had 5 6 years back so a lot of my people were picked up in interviews uh, in exchange of very confidential client data the business data so thankfully since my ethics my employees ethics were clear uh my company employees did not go into the hiring mode but i pity those companies who uh, kind of offer money to the uh, candidates in exchange of very confidential information trade secrets of a company uh if you are an entrepreneur i would say do not do that let it be a little a uh, time consuming journey but do not uh, you know uh, fall trap to the such unethical modes of hiring Uh, next craft something everybody uh, could own make something for them that everybody feels as a responsible towards it identify the ethical dilemmas that could come from time to time and trust me you will have lot of dilemmas uh, you know when you would grow as an uh, you know entrepreneur uh, you know uh, uh, in your journey uh, uh, so with that in mind we cover uh, the entire uh, you know uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, that we started off today for about 45 minutes or so uh and uh, what i'm going to end up uh, this with is uh, you know a key uh, conclusion summary uh, so protect your ip protect your technology do a market research done get your valuation done get your licensing done and that's the you know uh, you know way going forward and uh, uh, with this i would uh, you know thank you uh, with a very interesting entrepreneurship journey that i uh, you know often share so i have a lot of videos on youtube Uh, around it uh, as a as a resource person as a speaker as a mentor uh, but there's one story that i definitely would like to share with all and if you have been patient enough to listen to me t- all this while so when i started off this company uh, sigdesent uh, you know 7 8 years back uh, what i have faced was that i used to work in nights right now also you know uh, Uh, I, i am working at nights but then that time was very special because you are you know leaving your jobs i quit my job paying uh, you know stock rating salary checks and all you so work day and night to make sure sickness and uh, floats so today we have you know 80 uh, full time employees uh, in india and us uh, working so it's it's all there so what happened was that this time uh, you know i usually uh, go to the uh, bed late in night 4 am 5 in the morning Uh, and used to get up you know late in the noon uh, for for uh, for the next day's work 
now there are maids that used to come to help us in our um, you know ha- uh, homes as multiple of your homes may be getting support uh, from maids so this maid is always uh, you know asking my mother that why uh, you know uh, you know harit is sleeping uh, all the while so whenever uh, auntie ji i am here uh, you know what i see is that he is uh, you know always uh, sleeping so what happened was that uh, you know some day uh, my uh, she got uh, she got like totally uh, pissed off and she she kind of uh, you know asked me that uh, uh, why uh, is he always sleeping and you won't believe what happened was uh, that uh, she got into panic mode and what happened was uh, um, after a few weeks i had a very important uh, you know client call uh, that was to happen uh, you know uh, late uh, in the uh, night and what happened was i did the other way around so i worked till 10 11 am in the morning because there was a uh, late night early morning call so i was working till 10 am 11 am in the morning and i slept at 11 and i got up at 4 5 pm Uh, in the evening uh, to catch up my sleep but this maid then at that day didn't come at 9 or 10 am in the morning she came at 1 pm and i was still sleeping that day she lost it that she found me sleeping at 9 am she found me sleeping at 2 pm in the afternoon so she thought this guy is of no use and he's always uh, sleeping and that day he kind of uh, became my recruiter she went down in all the homes that she used to you know serve as maid a uh, kind of recommended me uh, that uh, bhaiya ki job lagwa do acche hain ye hai wo hai and today here i am uh, you know in front of all of you addressing everybody uh, and getting a fortune uh, to discuss my stories with you so you know i would suggest that keep patience stay ethical follow the right legal pathway do not give up get the perseverance that's a success uh, that you would have to follow uh, for becoming uh, you know a good startup with that in mind uh, thank you so much uh, everybody for liking uh, uh, this video and i hope if you want to listen more from me if you want to stay connected go to link then uh, find myself as harit mohan and we can be connected if you have some more questions that are not answered uh, today uh, i would love to you know answer them on the linkedin uh, page uh, or our signisense linkedin page of our company thank you so much stay safe stay home as much as you can follow the government instruction take care goodbye good night